I'm in the park again, hanging out with my friends. And while they don't really follow the social distancing guidelines, spending time with these peaceful animals seems to have a good effect on my health, even if just psychologically. Animals have been part of mythology since prehistoric times, and while they're often portrayed in a positive light, they're sometimes used to symbolize monsters or invasive threats, depending on one's cultural perspective. In folklore, a werewolf was a term which usually referred to a human with the ability to shapeshift into a wolf. We're all familiar with movies where this tendency to transform takes place at the site of the full moon, usually after being scratched or bitten by another werewolf. This isn't the only variation of the myth, as it was widespread in European folklore and in earlier times also applied to terms such as wolf riding and wolf charming. In Bavarian folklore around the Middle Ages, terms such as wolfsagen and wolfban refer to charms or incantations that either protected against wolves or spells that caused wolf attacks. In the folklore of German-speaking Europe, the people that were involved in this sort of magic were known as wolf charmers and were not humans that transformed into a wolf but usually depicted as wise elderly men that had a power or influence over wolves and made a living selling charms or incantations. Around the time of the 16th century, they began to be persecuted as witches, and in the early 1600s, a number of wolf sagner or wolf charmers were tried and executed as werewolves. I want to stress that at that time, the werewolf was not a shapeshifter, but a magician. And a typical example is the trial of an 84-year-old man named Thomas Heiser, who underwent extreme torture, which I don't want to describe because it's very graphic and brutal, but he eventually confessed to knowing how to perform wolfsagen, which he said he had learned from a friend 50 years earlier and had made his living by performing it for the peasants. He claimed to be able to call the wolves to attack a specific head of cattle and to have done this a total number of 10 times over a period of 40 years. After being severely tortured, he confessed that he had to promise his soul to the devil in order to learn the charm. But that part of the confession was something that the church usually demanded to justify mutilating and then burning people alive. Another famous case was of a German farmer named Peter Stump, who was nicknamed the Werewolf of Bedburg, and in 1589 was accused of werewolfery and witchcraft. After being stretched on a rack, and before further torture commenced, he confessed to having practiced black magic since he was 12 years old. He also confessed to many other sins during the torture, such as having intercourse with a succubus sent to him by the devil. But again, when someone's limbs are being torn off, they'll usually confess to anything. Peter Stump was then executed in one of the most brutal ways ever recorded. Quote, He was put to a wheel where his flesh was torn from his body in ten places with red-hot pincers, followed by his arms and legs. Then his limbs were broken with the blunt side of an axe head to prevent him from returning from the grave before he was beheaded and his body burned on a pyre. His daughter and mistress had already been flayed and strangled and were burned along with Stump's body. As a warning against similar behavior, local authorities erected a pole with the torture wheel and the figure of a wolf on it and at the very top, they placed Peter Stump's severed head. Persecution of wolf charmers were recorded in Bavaria and Austria until after 1650, with the final cases being placed in the early 18th century. After the end of the witch trials, the werewolf folklore emerged in the gothic horror genre and in modern horror and fantasy literature. But in the pre-Christian pagan era, Proto-Indo-European 
or Aryan mythology often includes a wolf as part of an aspect of the initiation of the warrior class, where a ritual is conducted to symbolically turn men into wolves, which from a medieval Christian perspective became associated with the devil. In Turkish and Central Asian folklore, shamans, after performing long and arduous rites, would voluntarily be able to transform into the humanoid Kurtadam, which literally means wolfman. And since the wolf was the totemic ancestor animal of the Turkic people, they would be respectful of any shaman who was in such a form. So in a shamanistic context, the transformation is on a soul level, where his spirit form may leave and his body remains behind in a trance state, unchanged physically. In some rituals, clothing is removed and a belt made of wolf skin or the entire animal skin is worn and a magic hallucinogenic ointment is rubbed on the body. A few references to men changing into wolves are found in ancient Greek literature and mythology. Herodotus, in his histories, wrote that Nuri, an Aryan tribe he placed to the northeast of Scythia, were all transformed into wolves once every year for several days and then changed back to their human shape. There are also stories of a temporary transformation into a wolf during sacrifice rituals to Zeus. The ancient Roman poet Virgil wrote of a man who used herbs and possibly psychedelic poisons that he picked to turn himself into a wolf. It seems implied that certain characteristics of the wolf were attained rather than a physical transformation. In Greek mythology, Dolon fought for Troy during the Trojan War and is often depicted wearing a wolf skin. The wolf also turns up in nationalist Germany as a term for the Fuhrer, whose military headquarters was also codenamed the Wolf Slayer. Its earliest origins possibly stretch back into the Pleistocene, or Ice Age, with the earliest domestication of wolves, which became companions to early modern humans, or who in the Ice Age, anthropologists refer to as Cro-Magnon. Some researchers speculate that the relationship between Cro-Magnon and domesticated wolves was an alliance that contributed to the victory of Cro-Magnon over Neanderthal species, which were eradicated around 30,000 years ago. The most popular explanation for the extinction of Neanderthals is climate change, but modern bone redating methods don't support that long-held theory. The evidence suggests that while Neanderthals had lived successfully in Europe and Asia, for several hundred thousand years, they became extinct when a newcomer suddenly shows up in the fossil and genetic record. Cro-Magnon appears around 40,000 years ago with a fully developed toolkit not found anywhere else on the earth. There were no gradual stages of development. The bifacial stone tool technology was sudden and a characteristic attributed to Cro-Magnon. That means bow and arrows, stone tip bifacial spear tips that you throw, not just pointy sticks with a sharp rock attached to it, but the kind that you throw, especially with an atoll atoll, which is a spear throwing device that makes the spear go farther and faster. Cro-Magnon had a larger cranial capacity 40,000 years ago than today's average, was seafaring, wore clothing, lived in wooden houses, and while the wood hasn't survived as evidence, the post that they made in the ground has. Cro-Magnon also domesticated animals, like horses, which I covered several times, and dogs, which to a large degree comes from domesticated wolves. The myths and legends of ancient antediluvian wars, such as the one between the Greek gods and the Titans, I've already discussed in prior videos where I identify the conflict in terms of haplogroups, such as R1A and R1B, which are terms describing the Y chromosome, which is attributed to men, 
passed down from father to son, and now I'd like to expand on this ancient war to merge with some anthropology in terms of the fossil record and genetics which come down to us in mythology. While some myths and legends involve a dragon, which burns down villages, takes cattle, and demands young virgin girls to presumably appease its sexual appetite, which I've associated with invading cultures that revered the serpent symbology, penetrating into Europe from Eurasia in the east. Now I'd like to talk about the ancient conflict between Cro-Magnon and Neanderthal which is also reflected in early myths as a war of the species between what are symbolically referred to as wolves and vampires. Having already associated the wolf to Cro-Magnon, let us take a closer look at Neanderthal, starting with its skull. The first noticeable difference is the shape of the skull, where Cro-Magnon had a round-headed shape like a basketball, the Neanderthal skull is elongated resembling more of a football. Both of them had large cranial capacity, but the shape of the skull was significantly different, including the face and the eyes. Not only did Neanderthal have a massive brow ridge, which means a protruding bone where the eyebrows are, but the eyes themselves were larger. They devoted a larger part of their brain to seeing, and while this possibly meant that they had better eyesight, in my personal opinion, it could also suggest that they were at least partially nocturnal. While most anthropologists will argue that Neanderthals lived in northern regions where the light was dimmer and their large eyes may have helped them to see better, I would also add that their lack of bow and arrows and inferior types of spears also indicated that they did not hunt as effectively in the daylight the same way that modern humans or Cro-Magnon and that they mainly operated at night. I'm not suggesting that they were exclusively nocturnal, but if they could see better in dim lighting than Cro-Magnon, it would make sense that they would exploit this advantage, especially if there was a conflict or an interspecies war. If you follow my line of reasoning so far, you can already see where I'm going with this, as vampires are traditionally afraid of the sunlight and were said to come out at night. That said, there's plenty of archaeological evidence suggesting that Neanderthals were cannibalistic, meaning they dined on human flesh. For example, in the caves of Belgium, bones from a newborn, a child, and four adults or teenagers who lived around 40,000 years ago show clear signs of cutting and of fractures to extract the marrow from within. Quote, it is irrefutable, cannibalism was practiced here, says Belgium archaeologist Christian Cassius. While Neanderthal took care of bodies of their deceased and held burial rituals, they also ate their dead. The bones show traces of cutting to remove the flesh. They also broke the bones in the same way that they broke those of reindeer and horses found at the entrance of the cave to extract the marrow. While archaeologists aren't sure if this cannibalism was systematic or only done at certain particular moments, such as in a ritual, I would speculate that if a species is cannibalistic, also drinking the blood would not be a far leap to speculate, nor would the consumption of the bodies of captured Cro-Magnon. The archaeological record confirms Neanderthal lives were anything but peaceful. Neanderthal skulls frequently show the marks of a blow to the head, presumably from a club, 
Another sign of warfare are fractures or a break to the lower arm caused by warding off blows. Neanderthals also show a lot of broken arms. At least one Neanderthal from Shanidar Cave in Iraq was impaled by a spear to the chest. Trauma was especially common in young Neanderthal males, as were deaths. Neanderthals occupied the Middle East for many millennia, and I would speculate that is one of the reasons there's still so much conflict there today. The Levant was not occupied by one species of hominin, and according to the ancient mythologies and guarded teachings of some secret societies, it was a scene of an ancient, unresolved war which still carried on until the Holocene, or our modern age. While some anthropologists will claim this struggle has been going on for hundreds of thousands of years, as they incorrectly lump Homo erectus with Cro-Magnon, probably because of their commitment to the Out of Africa hypothesis, which is politically motivated and at this point resembles a cult-like ideology rather than science. Recent genetic sequencing has disproved a smooth linear Out of Africa progression of one African hominin or race but rather supports a multi-regional model to explain the origin of modern racial populations. For example, present-day Sub-Saharan Africans trace up to 19% of their genetic ancestry to an extinct archaic hominin species, such as Homo erectus, that is not found in the DNA of present-day Asians or present-day Caucasians or Europeans. In any event, Cro-Magnon had very unique cranial characteristics. They're the only ones with a chin and forehead and no brow ridge. There are dental differences, meaning the teeth, the number of vertebrae, the number of ribs, differences in blood. And while there were complications with interbreeding, it did happen, but not hundreds of thousands of years ago. Cross-species interbreeding took place around 40,000 years ago and lasted for about 7,000 years, at which point Neanderthal disappears from the fossil record but still remains in certain demographics in the genetic record of some modern populations. Of course, certain groups which have infiltrated religious organizations and certain secret societies are also said to still participate in cannibalism blood consumption, and seem to have a political agenda which some have described as being antagonistic towards ancestors of Cro-Magnon types, which according to genetic sequencing are closely related, if not identical, to modern day Europeans. My name is Robert Sepper. I'm an anthropologist. My published work is available on Amazon, as well as through various other major book outlets. They make a great gift. If you'd like to support my work, you could do that through patreon.com. There should be a link in the description section for those that are interested. I appreciate it. Thank you. Please have a wonderful weekend, and I hope to see you again soon.